Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Friday, April 15th. And here is some of what we're talking about tonight. Russia is warning the U.S. to stop arming Ukraine or face what it calls unpredictable consequences. How concerned is the White House by that? The Pentagon says a Ukrainian missile did sink that Russian warship. We'll get into that with NBC's Ali Aruzi, and he will answer some of your questions about the war. Also, the nation's oldest senator faces a sensitive accusation. Some of Dianne Feinstein's colleagues claim she has become too senile to serve. She says she's still up to the job. A reporter who broke the story joins us ahead. Plus, can we find a way to deal with inflation if no one knows how long it'll last? One expert says yes. She'll share her tips later in the program. And it's Jackie Robinson Day, honoring the man who broke the major league color barrier. But would he be celebrating today if he was here? Based on one of his last interviews, probably not. Russia is gearing up for a new fight in Ukraine. One reason? Things have not gone as the Russian army had planned. Today, the Pentagon said that Ukrainian missiles did in fact hit a Russian warship this week. That vessel now sits at the bottom of the Black Sea. Russia's defense ministry has acknowledged that, sort of. It said the ship sank in stormy seas after an accidental fire caused an explosion. It happened about 65 miles south of Odessa, which is a city on the Black Sea. Meanwhile, Russia has sent a formal warning called a protest note for the U.S. to stop sending weapons to Ukraine. The note warns of, quote, unpredictable consequences. This was first reported by the Washington Post. NBC News has not seen the protest note ourselves, but a White House official has confirmed its contents to our team. Also, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is asking the Biden administration to designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. President Zelensky made that request in a recent phone conversation. All of this is happening as Russia's assault on key Ukrainian cities continues. Today, missile strikes hit Kyiv. Ukrainian officials are warning civilians of the potential for a new, bloodier phase of this war. Russian forces also fired on residential buildings in Kharkiv. That's according to that region's governor. And Russia continues to relentlessly bomb the southern port city of Mariupol. Tens of thousands of civilians remain trapped there. According to the UN's World Food Program, those civilians are in danger of, and these are their words, starving to death. NBC's Ali Arusi starts us off tonight from Lviv in western Ukraine. And Ali, what kind of retaliation might we expect to see from Moscow, particularly after the sinking of this warship? Well, Joshua, it was a massive embarrassment having, you know, the, one of their military, major military assets sitting at the bottom of the Black Sea. And the Ukrainians were expecting some retribution, and it came in the very early hours of yesterday morning when the Russians uh, hit a missile factory just on the outskirts of Kyiv. Uh, it was in that missile factory that the Ukrainians built uh, those Neptune missiles uh, that sunk the, the Moskva and putting it at the bottom of the Black Sea. And that was a very symbolic strike from the Russians. But I think that's probably just the tip of the iceberg from the Russians. They also carried out other attacks uh, this morning in Kharkiv. They hit a residential area in Kharkiv. Uh, they killed about seven people there, uh, amongst them a seven-month-old baby. So I think you're going to see a more and more retaliation from the Russians, but it's probably not retaliation. It's probably just this ongoing war, which they are uh, deeply embedded in, uh, and they will probably become more brutal as this progresses and the less ground they make. And, and I think the real key area to look out for is Donetsk, Luhansk, and the Donbass region. They've sent a massive column of uh, Russian hardware there, tens of thousands of troops. So they're digging in for a big battle there, and we could see some of the bloodiest scenes in this war in that region in the coming days and weeks. Talk to me about Russia's posture in this war so far. As we mentioned, President Zelensky is asking President Biden to designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. That would kind of shift the U.S. government's 
posture toward Russia, including its diplomatic posture, the ability to do business in Russia, which has already been curtailed by sanctions. Russia has warned the U.S. you better not keep arming Ukraine or something bad could happen. I'm not sure what we make of the rhetoric on either side compared to what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, but how do you see it? Well, look, they've, they've lost a lot of credibility uh, as a country. They were kicked off the UN Human Rights Council. You know, that's the United Nations saying that what Russia has done in this country goes against the values of the United Nations, that they are not worthy to sit on a body that decides about human rights. And, you know, if they were designated a state sponsor of terrorism, uh, that would put them as one of four countries that are considered a pariah in the world. There are only four countries designated by the State Department as sponsors of terrorism, and those are Iran, Syria, Cuba, and North Korea. And look how difficult life is for them. They're basically isolated from the world community. They have very few friends, very few backers, and the sanctions that are on those countries are amongst the heaviest sanctions anybody has to face. Uh, they're frozen out of the global financial system. It's very difficult for them to import, export goods. Hey, I think we're having a little trouble with Ali Aruzi's line there. Bear with us for a second. I'm going to give the control room just a minute to try to get him back on the line. But as you heard him saying just a moment ago with regard to Russia and its posture, there's only a handful of nations that have been designated as state sponsors of terrorism, Cuba, Syria, North Korea. And their relationship with the world, whether diplomatically or economically, is very strained. Granted, one of the nations that has done business with at least some of those countries is Russia. So what impact all of that would have if Russia was designated a state sponsor of terrorism among these other countries that it already has dealings with, who can say? But because of the mass graves that have been found in the last few days and because of some of the atrocities that have been committed in the, mass, in the last few days, it may be possible that the U.S. could create that designation. The issue then becomes what that designation would mean and what impact that would have. Let me see if we've got Ali. We're still trying to get Ali Aruzi on the line. It looks like we just lost his feed in Ukraine. Amazing we haven't lost it in all the conversations we've had thus far, but we're still getting his signal back up. Uh, Ali, I believe that we've got you back with us from Lviv in western Ukraine. And if you can hear me, I'd like to put a question to you from our okay. audience. We did get a few questions from viewers. Good. There you are. Glad to have you back. We did get a few questions from our viewers for you <laughs> about, apropos of this, about what it has been like to cover this war. Uh, Sally had a question for you as a journalist on the ground, and here's what Sally left in our inbox. I would really like to know how he and perhaps some of his colleagues prevent burnout. How do they recharge at the end of the day? What do they do for their own personal self-care? Do they try to work out if they can? Um, do they meditate? How do, how do they help themselves get through this situation so they can continue to do such excellent reporting? Thank you so much. Thank you for all the good work that you're doing. I appreciate you. We appreciate you, Sally. Greetings to you in Wyoming. Ali, what would you say to Sally? Well, thanks for that question, Sally. Well, ev everybody has their own routines here. I mean, I, I like to read a lot at the end of work. Our, our producer here, Dan Gallo, likes to go for a run in, 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 during the morning. And we finish very late. So we finish at like 6, 7 in the morning. And, you know, it's a nice fresh air. The city is empty. He'll go for a run. And this is an incredibly beautiful city that we're in, Lviv. So it's a, it's a bit of a treat to be here as well. The scenery is beautiful. That takes your mind off a lot of the atrocities and things that are happening here. But I think most of all is just working with a great team of people that we can decompress at the end of the day, talk about the things we've seen, that we've done, uh, maybe sometimes laugh a bit with one another. And like Sally said, some people will go to their rooms and meditate. Other people will, will exercise in their rooms. The gym and the hotel and things are closed, which is unusual for places like this because a lot of them are used as bomb shelters. But like I said, everybody has their own routine. But the most important thing is having a great career 
crew of people to work with and, be, and, and, and allow each other to decompress. And even, even people that you haven't worked with in a long time, you grow very close to them here and you can you know, share personal details about your home life. And, and that always helps a lot. Let me get to one more question from Sergio. Sergio with a, an email, a little bit lengthy, but I'll read it in, in his entirety. Sergio writes, first, let me start by thanking you and your news crew for everything you reported, most of all for allowing us, your viewers, the option to send in our questions and concerns, making us feel like we actually have a voice and feel like we matter. Absolutely, Sergio, thank you for writing into us. Now to his question. Sergio writes, why is it necessary for the news outlets to keep reporting on a daily basis lists of ways and arsenals that are being sent to Ukraine for help with the war against Russia. If we know Putin keeps threatening the U.S. and NATO with a nuclear attack, if we help Ukraine, then why not keep our help to Ukraine a secret instead? Why is there a need to announce every single detail regarding the help we provide? That's an interesting question from Sergio Ali in terms of the public nature of the support that Ukraine has been getting, not just, I think, from the U.S., but also from other countries, though he's asking about the U.S. What would you say to Sergio? Well, that's a great question by Sergio. And look, I mean, firstly, I'd like to say that, you know, we, we would never give out any sensitive information that if it's even passed on to us, a lot of it isn't passed off. So we would never give up anything strategic that would be harmful for Ukraine. And the Ukrainian authorities make that very clear. They say, you know, don't take photographs of something that may help the Russians. So we're always very cognizant of that. But in terms of the military equipment that's being sent uh, to Russia, first of all, the the the, the U.S. authorities are putting out that there themselves, uh, and that's reportable for us to do. And it also shows that they're helping uh, Ukraine in a fight that they think has been put onto them very unfairly. And the Ukrainians like that as well. They like us to tell them that they are, they like the world to know that they're being helped by the U.S., by Europe, uh, that they support them in this war, and they're not alone here. And it sends a message to the Russians that, you know, we're not going to tolerate this sort of uh, abuse of a sovereign country that you've invaded for no reason. So it's, a, it's about also showing support for Ukraine, and that's something the Ukrainians also find very important. They're always saying to us, which is very humbling to us, you know, thank you for getting these reports out of what's going on here, what help we're getting here. Uh, it's important that the world knows that we're not alone. Also, I neglected to mention Sergio is writing to us from Eagle Pass, Texas, which is right on the U.S.-Mexico border. City sits right on the Rio Grande. Thank you, Ali. As always, please do stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Ali Aruzi starting us off tonight from Lviv in Ukraine. Now, journalists like Ali help us understand what's going on there. And thank you all for your questions about how that work takes place. We very much appreciate it. Clearly, there's a lot to understand, including this war's growing death toll. Regional police outside Kyiv say that more than 900 civilians have been killed there. The largest number has been found in Bucha, northwest of Kyiv. That area has become almost synonymous with Russia's alleged war crimes. Some of the images from Bucha have been gut-wrenching. Recently, two mass graves were discovered. And among the everyday Ukrainians who are just trying to endure this war are photojournalists capturing its horror and its humanity. Joining us now is Heidi Levine, a photojournalist with The Washington Post. Ms. Levine, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. You've covered war zones and combat zones before. How does what you're seeing in Ukraine compare to other wars that you've covered, especially with some of the alleged atrocities that we've heard about in the last few weeks? Well. Every day we are seeing um, evidence of atrocities and war crimes committed by the Russian forces who have occupied uh, Bucha um, and other areas in Ukraine. And yes, I have covered other conflicts and I don't want to dismiss that um, people, especially civilians, have endured horrific situations. But in Ukraine, it just feels really different for all of us. Um, it's You just don't imagine, can't imagine that something like this is happening in 2022. Um, this is a war between uh, Ukrainian forces and a superpower. Um, 
So, I mean, every day we are, um, since the Russian forces left uh, Bucha and other areas, and now that we're able to enter these cities, we are finding um, evidence, seeing corpses all over the place. Um, I have photographed um, situations of where I saw eight uh, male civilians that had been executed, shot at short shot at short range, uh, showed signs of execution. Uh, one of the most horrific scenes I've, that I've encountered was uh, seeing a corpse that had been uh, intentionally beheaded. I have seen horrible scenes throughout my career following suicide bombings and, and um, bombing raids where civilians have been just blown to pieces. But this was the first time that I actually saw uh, a body that had been beheaded and had even seen another body close by uh, that showed evidence that his head, that someone tried to behead the body. Um, so everything feels very different. Um, Every day, um, there's new evidence. Another layer is is being uncovered. Um, yeah, showing the brutality of what's happening here in the country. I wonder if you could talk us through a couple of the photos that the Post sent our way from your work in Ukraine. This one, the first one we wanted to show, is of a group of volunteers that are carrying a body. Tell us more about this image. Well, this is what I was talking about um, before. Uh, this was a scene um, uh, where there were I had I saw eight male civilian um, bodies uh, that showed signs of um, of torture. Their hand, some of them had their hands uh, taped behind their backs. You could tell that they were shot at short range. And later in the week, I actually um, had a chance to see um, inside uh, that building where it was clear that Russian forces had been living inside it. It was completely trashed. Uh, it was beyond believable that anybody was even living inside. And, and um, it, all these things are happening. Yeah. Let me look at another picture of a woman named Victoria, who's 44 years old. Tell us a bit more about Victoria and this extremely distraught look on her face. What was she dealing with? Well, she was brought to the crime scene um, where, it, where uh, Ukrainian prosecutors had um, discovered a torture chamber where they had uh, found eight bodies Five, excuse me, five bodies that had been executed. There was still blood on the floor. There were evidence of um, body tissue um, on the wall. You could see that there were uh, gunshots on the wall. And she was brought to the scene uh, where her husband was executed. And of course, as you can see in her photo, it was a very emotional um, ordeal for her. I'm going to ask our control room to go to the photo for question six. This is a picture of a grave, and on it, someone has placed a teapot. What's the significance of the teapot on top of this grave? Well, um, in Ukrainian culture, it is a tradition um, to to give offer offerings to the deceased. It is believed that the deceased still after death need for several days still need to eat and drink a cloth is placed over the grave uh to to be used to wipe their tears not the tears of of the relatives but the tears of the deceased because they believe that when someone dies they still have the same needs um as the living in the beginning until they cross over to the afterlife I have to ask you before I, I got to let you go, I, I've talked to a number of people in our audience <clears throat> who said that they felt like they couldn't pull away from this story. It was important to look at it as much as possible 
to look at the atrocity of it as much as possible, just in a form of solidarity. And part of me as a journalist thinks, that's easy for you to say from America. You're not actually there looking at it in person, but you are looking at it in person. Before I let you go, how do you bear to look at some of the things that you photographed? How do you deal with these images yourself? Well, in many cases, I feel as though I'm actually a forensic photographer, uh, uncovering, investigating, and documenting um, images that I hope um, can be used in a criminal work case and crime case. And I feel what I'm doing and what my colleagues are doing uh, is very, very important. And this is the only way that hopefully justice will be brought. Um, of course, nothing is going to bring back the people that have been killed or their homes that have been destroyed. But I hope that, uh, you know, I can play a, a small part um, to make a difference. Heidi Levine, photojournalist with The Washington Post, I appreciate you talking us through some of those images. I hope that the impact of your work brings you peace, at least knowing that you've helped the rest of the world see what's going on there. And we thank you for making time for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And I really want to take this moment to thank the people in Ukraine who have allowed me to document their lives. Thank you. Abs absolutely. Thank you. We appreciate it. Good night. Still to come, Senator Dianne Feinstein is responding to claims that she is mentally unfit to serve. And later, an expert will share some tips on how to make your dollars stretch, especially with inflation bending our budgets. This Friday night for Now Tonight from NBC News. California Senator Dianne Feinstein is facing an unusual controversy over her age and her ability. She is the nation's eldest senator, 88 years old. But some of her colleagues are suggesting that her mental faculties have diminished to the point where she should consider stepping down. Now, this is a sensitive story, right? None of us can diagnose her from a distance. And the senator is refuting those claims. She has said, quote, the real question is whether I'm still an effective representative for 40 million Californians, and the record shows that I am, unquote. Now, for a number of her fellow senators, that's not a matter, it's not, not an issue of her record, and her record is extensive. Senator Feinstein helped enact the federal assault weapons ban back in 1994. She worked to legalize same-sex marriage and ensure rights for the LGBTQIA community. She also authored a major cybersecurity bill. But for them, this is not about what she has done. It's about what she's capable of doing now. And it's hard to ignore these concerns considering who is raising them. Yesterday, the San Francisco Chronicle published a story quoting people close to her, raising questions about her memory. The Chronicle says its sources include four of her fellow senators, mostly other Democrats. Also, three of her former staffers and a Democratic member of Congress from California. Now, the state's junior senator, Alex Badilla, spoke to the paper on the record. He acknowledged the concerns, but said that, quote, she's still doing the job and doing it well, unquote. Both California senators serve on the Judiciary Committee. Aging can be uncomfortable to talk about. People are living longer, and no one likes to think about losing their usefulness. But Senator Feinstein is not up for re-election until 2024. If these accounts are true... What should Californians do? Joining us now is Tal Copen, Washington correspondent for the San Francisco Chronicle. Welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. So what is the latest with all of this? I mean, has this concern, this set of concerns about Senator Feinstein prompted any more responses? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I do wonder what perhaps we might have seen if, if you know, the Hill was in session and senators were being asked about this in, in the hallways. But there has been a bit of a muted response. Certainly, Senator Feinstein has defended herself. And I've seen some statements in, in other outlets who have been reporting on our reporting uh, from other folks. But, you know, it's been kind of quiet, uh, which I think is is quite interesting. But we I have seen 
you know, I've seen people discussing the difficulty of uh, experiences they've had perhaps with family members or people close to them who have suffered from perhaps similar lapses in memory and discussions that have to be had about that. I've seen a lot of sympathy in that sense. I've seen other people discussing whether there needs to be some sort of term limit system. I mean, a few mentioned age limits, but, and you mentioned ageism in the opening. I mean, it's hard because I interact with, with other people in their eighties on the Hill who are still sharp as a tack. It's not like there's a clear dividing line. You know, in this instance, we followed very specific reporting about a specific elected official uh, and details about, you know, specific memory issues. Yeah, there are seven octogenarians in the Senate. We've got a list. Let's put those on the screen. The seven who are in the Senate, you've got Diane Feinstein of California, Chuck Grassley of Iowa, Richard Shelby of Alabama, James Inhofe of Oklahoma, Patrick Leahy of Vermont, Bernie, Patrick Leahy and Bernie Sanders of Vermont, and Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. So she's not the only person in their 80s who is serving in the Senate. Why do you think all of this is coming up now, of all times? Is it just because the Senate's going on holiday break and they can get away from Capitol Hill without reporters chasing them in the hall to ask them questions? Or is there another reason why these, are, these senators are saying this now? Well, to be clear, I've been working on this story for some time. And in fact, you know, the the anecdote I mentioned and in, in to open the story of a, a California Democratic member of Congress who had a, a lengthy interaction with the senator in which not only did they not have the sort of rigorous and detailed policy discussion this person had become accustomed to having with Senator Feinstein over the more than a decade that they had interacted and worked with each other. Not only did they not have that kind of interaction, but this lawmaker had to introduce themselves once more to Senator Feinstein and then reintroduce themselves uh, multiple times over the course of the conversation because over the several hours that they interacted, she would forget portions of the conversation that they had already had. And this, this took place several weeks uh, before her husband's passing in February. So that gives you a sense of, I, I've, been, I've been working on this story for some time and, and <laughs> the senators going on recess, they did not get to pick when the story published. That was just perhaps a lucky coincidence for them. But in terms of the question of why now, you know, this is this is something that has been out there for uh, in the past. My reporting certainly indicates uh, to some degree it has been progressing over the years. There was a round of reporting in 2020 uh, that was mainly focused on whether she would be up to chairing the Judiciary Committee, as she was in line to do if Democrats took the Senate, as she did, and she stepped aside from that. Uh, so, you know, I, I can't specifically say why people would be willing to talk now versus other time. For me, it was a matter of when is the reporting in a place where I'm convinced by what my sources are telling me, and I believe that it's information my readers need to know and that my readers will be right. convinced by uh, when we lay it out. And so, you know, that information has come together at this time. It's one of those interesting things about the Senate. It's supposed to have this kind of deliberative quality to it. The level heads, presumably some of the older and wiser voices in the American body politic to kind of manage the passions of the public. And you are rewarded in the U.S. Senate for your longevity, right? The longer you serve, the more senior you become just by dint of your endurance in the U.S. Senate. I, I wonder what that means going forward. I mean, Dianne Feinstein is from a certain generation of senators who are used to, you know, fighting like crazy in public and then connecting in private, working things out and getting stuff done in Congress. And the tone in Congress is changing dramatically. The tone in the body politic is changing dramatically. What does this mean for her going forward, two years out from her reelection, but also in a nation where kind of our political mood, our political decorum is shifting? Sure. Well, I mean, if we set aside for a moment, uh, you know, this, the specific question of her memory, if you're just, if you just wanted to talk about the fact that if she wanted to run again, in 2024, which at this point she could do if she wanted to, uh, I do not think she would go without a very strong challenge. In fact, she might face more than one strong challenger if she were to run again. There is a long list of ambitious California politicians who have been eyeing that Senate seat that she has held for three decades. They've been eyeing it for a long time, and they've been waiting for their turn to run for one of the few statewide offices in California where there's a lot of political talent and only so many of the top jobs. And, you know, 
as you mentioned, there's sort of a new era of politics. I think all of this question of her memory aside, uh, she would be vulnerable to a challenge just on the political merit. Now, it, turning back to what my reporting has indicated about perhaps her her fitness for the job, which, you know, it, it is to a certain extent a matter for the voters. They reelected her in 2018, but things can change right. over six years and there's really no mechanism if the voters wanted to, you know, have a sort of no confidence at this point, there's no mechanism for that uh, to happen. Uh, certainly what we have observed in terms of being able to navigate the job of the Senate, which some of her colleagues who know the job best have told me they don't really think she's capable of fully doing anymore. She's extremely reliant on staff uh, to get through that. And, and her work is incredibly scripted. I mean, she basically reads uh, statements and questions and hearings and uh, staff talks her through hearings, you know, where they have to vote on multiple amendments. There's a staff member that sort of hovers over her for those votes. Uh, so, right. you know, that's, that's what we've certainly observed about how she's doing the job right now. Right. And I do want to be clear again, we, we, we cannot diagnose Senator Feinstein from a distance, but I do take your point in terms of the people who may be waiting in the wings kind of for that opportunity. You know, Barbara Boxer's Senate seat was one of the hottest tickets in town when she left the Senate. And I'm sure the race to succeed Senator Feinstein will be very pitched indeed. Tal Copen, Washington correspondent for the San Francisco Chronicle. I appreciate you making time to break this down for us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including deadly flooding in South Africa. More than 300 people were killed. Plus, presidential debates as we know them may be a thing of the past. That's all just ahead. Stay close. The traditional presidential debates may sound rather one-sided in the future, if they happen at all. The Republican Party says it is withdrawing support for the Commission on Presidential Debates. A statement from RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel called the commission biased. She added that it has, quote, refused to enact simple and common sense reforms to help ensure fair debates, unquote. Ms. McDaniel says her party will find other platforms for its candidates to debate in. In response, the Democratic National Committee pointed to a previous statement from its chairman, Jamie Harrison. He said that Republicans, quote, can't win a fair fight and they know it, unquote. Now, the Commission on Presidential Debates is an independent nonprofit. It's not part of the U.S. government, and the major parties only take part in its debates voluntarily. Back in January, the Commission said that its 2024 plans will be based on fairness and neutrality. We've reached back out for further comment, and we're waiting to hear back. Now, at the time when this happened initially, we spoke to the RNC's national spokesperson, Paris Denard. He argued that the group is not living up to its mandate. It should be fair. It should be objective. And, and, the, and the whole purpose of the debate is to provide that, that platform, a fair platform, and there's guidelines that are placed beforehand, same podium height, notes or no notes, lighting, all of the things, time, all things are designed to be fair. What we saw with the debate commission was unfairness. Debates among presidential candidates were not common until the mid-20th century. The first televised debate was in 1960 between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. NBC's Sander Van Oker was one of the panelists. Opening statements were eight minutes long. In South Africa, the search for survivors continues after some major flooding. The death toll is more than 340 people and counting. This week, floods swept through the eastern part of South Africa. They collapsed homes, washed away roads, and toppled piles of shipping containers. Listen to one father who survived this disaster. He says it not only tore homes apart, but also his family. My neighbors, uh, they tried to assist me. It took uh, two hours. After two hours, I will survive. But unfortunately, my child. Not survive. 
Survivors are searching for their loved ones as they also look for food, water, and shelter. The South African government called this one of the nation's worst storms ever, and forecasters are expecting more heavy rain in the coming days. It is uncommon for Passover, Ramadan, and Easter weekend to happen at the same time. In Jerusalem, tensions are high around a site that Jews and Muslims both hold sacred. Today, a chaotic scene unfolded at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Thousands had gathered there for prayers. The holy site has seen a number of clashes between Israelis and Palestinians. This evening, the U.S. State Department urged both sides to show restraint and restore safety. From our partners at Sky News, Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle has the story. The second Friday of Ramadan and the first day of Passover did not begin peacefully in Jerusalem. As dawn prayers finished in the old city, Israeli police went into the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, firing stun grenades and tear gas. The Palestinian Red Crescent said that more than 150 people were injured. A field hospital was set up inside the compound to treat them. Eight policemen were also wounded. Israeli police say they were reacting to rioters who were throwing rocks at them and at Jewish worshippers praying at the adjoining Western Wall. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third most holy site in the Islamic faith. Images of smoke grenades thrown through its windows and armed police actually inside the mosque itself has angered the Muslim world. It was brutal, brutal reaction of the Israeli police and brutal uh, attack against prayers inside the mosque, inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The standoff continued through the morning, but by lunchtime, hundreds had been arrested and it was calm again. Noon prayers, the main prayers on a Friday, have just finished and they were peaceful this time. In no small part because Israeli police spent much of the morning arresting hundreds of people they think were involved in the violence. Jerusalem, compared to Ramadan last year, has been relatively calm. That might now change. The Israeli Prime Minister met with senior police officers today. We are working to calm things on Temple Mount and throughout Israel. At the same time, we are prepared for any scenario. Large protests took place in Gaza following Friday prayers there. Hamas has put its military wing on a war footing. If the group decides to launch missiles into Israel in response to what happened in Jerusalem, then the chances of an all-out conflict grow even greater still. <laughs> Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Coming up, driving to the grocery store is getting more expensive now, and once you get there, the prices can be pretty steep. How can we all make our dollars go a little farther, especially with serious inflation? An expert answers your questions when we come back. This week, inflation in America hit a 41-year high, but it looks like there's been a little relief with gas prices, a little. Today, a gallon averages $4.07 nationwide. A month ago, it was nearly $4.32, but a year ago, it was $2.86. And it's not just gas prices, cars, travel, furniture, groceries, appliances. It kind of seems like everything costs more these days. Now, both chambers of Congress have tried to take on inflation in the past year. The House and Senate passed versions of the America Competes Act, but they'll have to find common ground before the bill can head to President Biden. He is pushing Congress to combine the two bills. The idea is to ramp up microchip production. A chip shortage has driven up prices for a number of products worldwide. But in the meantime, how can we all spend our money a little bit better? Joining us now is Tanya Hester. She's the author of Wallet Activism, How to Use Every Dollar You Spend, Earn, and Save as a Force for Change. Ms. Hester, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Glad to be with you. 
Where are you seeing the most potential for people across the country right now to try to pinch a few pennies? It feels like everybody's got something in terms of the rising costs of living where you just butt up against the limits of your budget and there's just no flex. There's just nowhere to move. Yeah, that's right. You showed some of the numbers that are higher rates of inflation than most of us have seen uh, in memory. You know, as you said, 41 years is the last time inflation was this high. And groceries are a big one. We know that in total, groceries are at almost 9% inflation year over year. And that's a lot of uh, growth. And so um, the biggest area, though, that folks can, can look to save is very much in energy. Um, you're looking here at gasoline prices. Those are, are certainly up a great deal. I don't think anyone needs us to tell them that. Um, but we also know that heating oil for homes is up a great deal. And all of that's going to have an impact on your electricity bill, um, your other utilities. And so whether it's driving less, whether it's trying to find a way to carpool to work, if you're going into the office or into your workplace these days, um, if it's looking at maybe doing another summer of staycation instead of road tripping, I know people are really dying to get out and to have a change of scenery. And so, you know, your mileage may vary. Use this uh, however fits for you. But if you're able to cut back on how much you're driving and how much you're heating and cooling your home, that's certainly a big area to save. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that in terms of like travel and vacations. I love movies and haven't been to a like a movie movie in a while. And so now <laughs> that I think I feel okay going to a movie theater, I might like make that a mini staycation and do that as something special of all things that now going to a movie feels like something special. But I understand. With regards to prices, though, the consumer price index is one way of gauging economic impacts. And the CPI rose eight and a half percent in the month of March. How do you see people protecting themselves from that impact? Yeah, you know, even without food and energy included in that, it's still at six and a half percent. We tend to look at them separately because food and energy are the most volatile. Um, but even if you're looking outside of that, some of the things that you can do are to try to delay big expenditures. So if you know that you'd like to have a new car, I'm sure you've seen that the price of new cars is way up because there is a lot of demand and not a lot of supply because of that superconductor shortage and the shortage of a lot of electronic components. But the price of used cars is up a great deal. And so if you can put that off for, you know, as long as we're in this high inflation time, you can certainly help yourself a great deal. And I think this is a great time, honestly, you know, we're looking also at climate change being an issue. So this is a great time to look at your consumption levels overall, both for how they impact your own wallet and for how we could reduce demand so that we're also using fewer of the Earth's resources, harming the climate, climate less. Um, but overall, I think um, looking to put off expenditures as long as you can is great if you're able. Um, or honestly, something that we haven't been talking about enough, I think, in this um, inflationary environment is how much the inflation and the supply chain issues are being driven by demand that's incredibly high. People are buying a lot of stuff, and that's creating some of the shortages. It's creating a lot of the inflation and the high prices. And so if you're somebody who's lucky enough not to be feeling the pinch right now, you know, you're saying, well, yeah, this inflation's a bummer, but I can handle it. A good public service that you can do is to cut your consumption as well yeah. to help bring some of this back to a reasonable level. Let me get to one viewer story before I have to let you go. One of our viewers wrote, I'm saving less, I'm spending less on luxury items, and I'm living in fear of the student loan freeze ending at my current pay rate. Same with rent. I've tried to buy a house, but due to an appraisal gap I couldn't make up, the seller is backed out before closing. Tanya, what would you say to them before we go? Yeah, I think that's a really common set of anxieties that a lot of folks can relate to. I think, you know, we've talked about some of the ways that you can save costs. Another big point is to try hard to get a raise. You know, this is a time where workers have a lot more power than they've had in recent years. And so this is a good time if you haven't negotiated a raise. Maybe it's time to find another job offer that you can use to leverage a raise. Um, but bumping your earnings up is really going to give you the best chance of being able to get on top of those expenses as high as they are. We did actually have a conversation on this program about negotiating for better terms at work. I'll ask our team to re-up that on social media, but you might be able to find it if you're watching this. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram.
Tanya Hester, appreciate you making time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Tributes are flowing in on this Jackie Robinson day. But how would Mr. Robinson himself feel about all of this? We'll take a closer look before we go. It is a proud thing to break a color barrier. It's also a shame that anyone has to. On this day 75 years ago, Jackie Robinson had to. He became the first black man to play in a Major League Baseball game. His number 42 jersey debuted with the Dodgers of Brooklyn before they headed to L.A. Jackie Roosevelt Robinson was born in Georgia, and he excelled at sports from a young age. He was so good, he played four sports at UCLA, baseball, basketball, football, and track. But financial issues forced him to leave college early and join the Army. After a few years of service, Jackie Robinson was honorably discharged. He had refused to move to the back of a segregated bus. But his discharge led to his baseball career. Teams were still segregated then, so Robinson joined the Negro Leagues in 1945. That changed in 1947 when the Brooklyn Dodgers asked him to join the team. Jackie Robinson retired with a 313 batting average, 972 runs, 1,563 hits, and 200 stolen bases. In 1962, he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and now, every April 15th, all Major League Baseball teams celebrate Jackie Robinson Day. But is that what he would have wanted? Would Jackie Robinson want us to focus on celebrating the barrier he broke? Or to acknowledge that the barrier should have never been there? Joining us now is sports writer and author Ron Rappaport. He recently wrote a piece for the Los Angeles Times remembering one of Jackie Robinson's last interviews. Mr. Rappaport, welcome to the program. Good to be with you, Joshua. Thanks for having me. What's been your view of how the league has been celebrating Jackie Robinson Day today? There's been a lot going on on the 75th anniversary. Well, I have to smile. Joshua, may I take you back 50 years to the celebration Please. of the 25th anniversary? It was much smaller. It lasted 10 minutes. There were no uh, celebrations in every ballpark in the country. All the players weren't wearing 42. There were about a dozen people on the field. Um, Red Barber, the Dodgers announcer, uh, Jackie's teammates, Pee Wee Reese and Joe Black, Bowie Kuhn. And when it came Jackie's time to speak, he said a few nice words. I'm pleased to be here today, pleased and proud to be here today. But he couldn't let it go. At the end, he said, I'll be more pleased and more proud when I can look across the diamond into the third base dugout and see a black man coaching baseball. So what would he tell us today? I think he'd say, why are there only two black managers today? Where are the black general managers? Where are the black owners? The key to understanding Jackie was to understand that he was never satisfied. He would fight racism, fight bigotry until the end of his time. He was never going to give up. He was never going to make nice to baseball. One of the things he told me in our conversation four months before he died was that Baseball and Jackie Robinson haven't had very much to say to each other. And I'm glad I haven't had to go to baseball on my knees. He was bitter, Joshua. He was angry. Mm. And he was always going to be that way. So these celebrations are nice. But in a way, it's kind of lucky that Jackie's not still around because he would have made baseball squirm today just the way he did 50 years ago. I really appreciate the piece that you wrote for the LA Times. I'll, I'll share it out on my social when the show's over. I'm at NBC Joshua. I really appreciate the piece because I think it gets at some of the complexity that sports have been dealing with throughout. I mean, between Jackie Robinson, between, you know, black Olympians raising a black power fist, Colin Kaepernick on the sidelines taking a knee, you know, LeBron James responding to Laura Ingram saying, shut up and dribble. I mean, we, we keep kind of, or even Brian Flores' lawsuit now against the NFL, we keep kind of coming up against the tension between the progress we've made and how far we have yet to go. What I'd like to do is deconstruct Jackie Robinson Day for just a minute. What are we celebrating here? What is baseball celebrating? They're celebrating uh, 
breaking down the racial barriers, becoming the first black player, overcoming the racism in baseball. But here's the question. Who put those barriers in place in the first place? Who, who enforced that racism over all those years? This day has been called the greatest moment in baseball history, the day Jackie took the field uh, for the first time with the Brooklyn Dodgers. But baseball, it seems to me, is celebrating Jackie's victory over baseball. And the more that baseball uh, aligns itself with it, baseball is celebrating its, Jackie's victory over itself. I think we have to keep this in mind in the midst of all the excitement and all the fun that they're going to be having tonight. Jackie Robinson Day is a wonderful day. It is great to remember him. It's great to remember what he did for the game. But let's also remember what he stood for and how he would have said, can't we do better? I, I only got a minute or so to before I have to let you go. In terms of what Jackie said with black managers, black leadership, how much, if at all, do you see the major leagues making progress in that regard before we go? Well, in some ways, they're regressing. For instance, they've cut way back on the minor leagues. There are far fewer minor league teams now than there were three or four years ago. That means that there's less room for young players to make themselves, less to, to show themselves, to make a career for themselves, less room for young black players also. Not just, not just white players, but black players, too. So baseball is, they're holding all kinds of seminars and, and, and you know, places for kids to play and so on. And that's wonderful. But not everything they're doing is, is helping the cause of black players. I don't think so. Ron Rappaport, I appreciate the piece that you put in the L.A. Times. I'm going to ask our team to share that back out at NBC Now tonight. And I also am glad that you're able to help kind of with this piece, Thread the Needle, about being able to both celebrate the good and remember the struggle and hold both of those thoughts in our heads and our hearts at the same time. Appreciate you coming on, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Joshua. I really appreciate being here. And with that, your weekend may begin. If this is a holy weekend for you, then I hope you have a blessed Passover, Ramadan, and or Easter. We always welcome your questions about the news, your stories about how the top stories affect you, or just your feedback about our show. What do you think? We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can always leave us a voicemail directly, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you for making time for us, and we'll see you Monday. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.